So welcome to uh, the first Sooner Safer Happier meetup of 2022. Um, it's really lovely to have you all back to see all your faces and um, I hope you all had a fantastic uh, holiday period and Christmas. Um, so welcome, welcome back again, thank you. Um, how today will run is we have uh, the brilliant Giles Turnbull uh, speaking to us on Agile Comms. Um, once uh, Giles has, has shown us uh, his uh, presentation, his talk, then we'll have some conversation, ask questions, which you like, there'll be about, I think about 25 minutes of that. Um, and then also at the end, um, please shout me if I forget, but I want to put up uh, a link to uh, a mentee so that we can get your feedback because we love feedback here. Um, and I often run away with myself and forget to do that. So shout out Matt, the mentee, uh, before we leave. And uh, all answers are anonymous and hidden. Um, so don't worry about just uh, putting that up there. It'll be open for uh, the next few days. So thank you very much. So the main topic of discourse for tonight. Um, I am super happy that Giles is here. Um, you may have seen me post on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter lately that um, I've been to Giles's book. Um, I read it lately. Or what I put, I think, was that um, I mostly read it, and that's like most books. I mostly read, um, but I am absolutely hooked. What I see, and we see some Tom's got his there, his copy there. Um, for a, a long, long time, I have. Um, uh, banged on about uh, communicating. Agile is about communication. It's about flows of information. And at scale, which we are very interested in, at Sooner Safer Happy, how do we get big organizations um, maneuvering and pivoting and using agility? Um, and obviously the bigger the organization, the more that we pull on how we can communicate with one another and how we can get those flows of information going. Um, so the, the book has absolutely resonated for me, um, that it is about uh, communication. Um, how can we do that in the easiest possible way? And how can we turn traditional communication um, and use a, a, a more up-to-date or more uh, aligned with how we're doing the work type of communication? And, and it's all down here in this book. And I've, I've, um, uh, as, I, as I flip through the page of this book, I'm just nodding my head and laughing and going, yes, out loud. Um, so that's my endorsement of this book. Uh, it's well thumbed, as you can see, a bit, uh, a bit uh, uh, damaged now, really, from the amount of times I've been using it. Um, enough of that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn over to Giles now so he can, he can give us a treat and, and tell us how he, how he came about putting this together and all of the fantastic things within it. So um, yeah, thank you very much, Giles, for joining us. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm not going to tell you everything in the book. I'll tell you that now, because um, we've only got 50 minutes. So we'll, we'll, we'll go quite quickly. Um, forgive me for two seconds while I do the inevitable screeny clicky magic. Um, hopefully, you can now only see one of me. Is that correct? Matt, can you give me a thumbs up if I'm... Yes. Okay, good. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk to you this evening about five ways to get started with Agile Comms. Um, this, is, this is literally just skimming over the surface of a few things that I talk about in the book. Um, and um, obviously I'm here to plug the book, but thanks very much, Matt and the team for inviting me along to come and talk to you. It's a real privilege. It's a real pleasure. Uh, this is the most fun I've had since well before Christmas, trust me, because my Christmas was pretty quiet. Okay. Um, my name's Giles. I help, help organisations communicate more like humans do. That's my thing. That's what I do. Um, I have a tiny little website called Use the Human Voice because that's the name of my tiny little company. And I wrote this tiny little book. Here it is. Uh, Matt's already shown you his copy. Um, this one's a, a little... A little less creased um, and uh, it's called the Agile Comms Handbook and it basically sums up all the things that I say most frequently in meetings. Um, it's quite a short book, it's less than 200 pages and, and quite frankly there's not a lot of words per page so you can get through it pretty quickly if you want to. Um, 
the whole point of agile comms the idea behind it is that it's a set of techniques to help teams communicate clearly and creatively about work in progress but there's a whole lot of thinking about why i've got to that point and where that came from um, part of that a lot of it in fact is because i used to work for the government a few years ago particularly the bit of the uk government that makes gov.uk the official government website the story there is that there used to be 1882 uk government websites um, all the different government departments had one in fact most of them had several uh, all the different uh, government agencies and arm's length bodies and government owned companies they all had their own websites all of them were commissioned and funded designed differently some of them were okay, many of them were awful. And the idea of gov.uk was to combine as many of them as possible into one place uh, and to make it uh, a user-centric place uh, to apply user-centered design to uh, the, the, the whole production methodology behind that site. There are still some of those rogue websites around. They do still exist, but there are far, far fewer of them than there used to be, and that is a good thing. Uh, the team working on gov.uk, early on in its life, that team put together this list of design principles. Now, having a list of design principles is nothing special in its in per se, but this particular list was used to guide the team's work. Um, it was used as an onboarding mechanism, quite frankly. You know, you turned up on your first day, they handed you a laptop, they pointed at this list and they said, as long as you're doing these, you're probably doing the right thing. Uh, the team that I was part of, the creative comms team, um, our job was mostly number 10 at the bottom here, make things open, it makes things better. That's what we were there to do. Uh, we were there to open up the work of the government digital service, uh, which was the organize, organization behind Gov.uk and help the rest of the world understand what it was doing and why it was doing it in a particular way, which was a predominantly agile sort of way. Um, agile wasn't particularly a new idea, but it was pretty new in government. There weren't a lot of teams making use of this um, and using it for user-centered design on the internet at the time. Things have changed since then, of course. So our job was to make things open and make them better than that. That means we, we wrote or ghost wrote many, many hundreds of blog posts. Uh, we organized quite a lot of events. We made quite a few videos and stuck them up on YouTube. And we made a lot of ephemeral stuff, things like stickers and writing snappy catchphrases and uh, making posters and things like that. Uh, one, of the, one of the most popular posters was this one that my team was involved in making. Um, it, it was an, an exercise in onboarding in its own right. The idea behind this poster was that it was a list of things that it's good to know, but that it's nobody's job to tell you. And so it was useful for getting newcomers to the organization up to speed with the culture uh, without, having, without making them read very long, dull, boring documents. Um, this poster idea has been uh, remixed and borrowed by quite a lot of other organizations, quite a lot of government teams around the world, most recently by Google, who did their own version, uh, which was also the same shade of bright yellow, but it had some different words on it. Um, in the spirit of that poster, and uh, given that we are, I'm talking to you this evening, well, it's evening where I am, nearly, um, and it's the end of the day, so uh, please, as far as I'm concerned, it's okay to do all of these things or not do all of these things, it's completely fine. Um, particularly the leave early because you're busy bit, um, I, I know what it's like. Um, anyway, let's get on to the useful stuff. The five tips for getting started with agile comms. Uh, all of this is in the book. If you do want to know more, you can find out by uh, buying a copy and I'll show you how to do that later. Uh, number one for those things, number one is, to look for things that need more layers of explanation. And this is founded in one of my central hypotheses for life, which is this, that everyone is already too busy most of the time. And if, if you disagree with this, I'll be quite surprised, frankly. I have never done one of these sessions in real life 
or on a video call and found anyone who actually disagrees with this. Um, if you want proof, look at your calendar, look at your colleagues' calendars, come and look at mine if you like, it's a nightmare. Um, and this is normal. This is the day-to-day -day reality for most of us, for most of the people that we work with, for most of our stakeholders, for most of our bosses, our funders, um, our government teams, everyone is pretty much already too busy most of the time. And that, if you accept that to be true, and I do, that has consequences. It means, quite frankly, nobody has time to pay attention to you and your thing. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your thing is, nobody really has time to pay attention to it, unless you give them a reason to pay attention. And this is where layers of communication come in useful. Um, I tend to think of these layers as these three blocks. I'm, I'm going to move slightly out of the way so you can read that word at the bottom there. The, the block at the bottom here, the detail layer, this usually exists by default because this is the work. This is the stuff that you and your teams are making and producing and creating day to day. It's, it's not hard to find the detail. The problem that most teams that I end up working with have is that when they are asked to communicate about their work, their, frequently their first choice is to hand over the detail. Uh, they'll do things like uh, sharing a shared folder, for example. Here you go. Here's our shared folder. The entire project is in here. Uh, go crazy. Have fun. Uh, which, of course, is useful, but also useless because everyone is already too busy. They don't have time to read through an entire folder full of stuff. Um, I once joined an organization as a contractor and uh, I was asked to read some documentation and I had to tick a box to say that I'd read it. There were 80,000 words in those documents. That's, that's a reasonable sized novel. Um, this is typical behavior in a lot of organizations. Uh, what I argue is that you need to put effort into creating those extra layers on top. Very often, most of the time, you need a context layer. It's something that gives you the gist, something that gives you the basics. Forgive me, there is now a helicopter passing outside, so that's the background noise, if you can hear that. The context layer doesn't always exist, but sometimes it does, but it needs to be shorter. It needs to be more brief than the detail layer. It needs to give you just enough so that you know enough and it needs to enable you as a reader to make a decision when you get to the end of it. And that decision is, can I stop now? Or do I want to read more? If I do want to read more, great. Give me a way to read the detail. If I don't want to read more, make sure you've told me enough. Sometimes, as well as that, you need a lure layer. Not always, but sometimes. Sometimes you need to actively attract people's attention to make them come and listen to you and pay attention to you and your thing. In those circumstances, you might end up having to borrow ideas from the world of advertising, because that's what advertising does. It makes us pay attention to things. And if you're borrowing ideas from advertising, then that means you're going to be maybe sprinkling a little bit of creativity, a little bit of poetry on top of your work. We'll come back to that later on. The main thing to think about here is that these layers are really useful to have, but they don't always exist or not all of them always exist. So one of the helpful things you can do or your teams can do is try and spot those occasions where there's a context gap where you could really do with a short, snappy one pager that sums up the gist of what you're trying to say. And then at the end of that one pager, there is something that makes it easy for readers to go on if they make that decision that they want to, a link to the detail. Okay, let's move on from that. The people, oh, I'm in the wrong place. I'm gonna switch over there. The people who are really good at this are the TV scientists. Uh, some of you will recognize uh, this is Mary Beard. Uh, she is a, a, a historian particularly of Roman classical history. And uh, she has a 30 plus year career 
writing academic papers and books about that subject. She's really, really good. She knows her stuff, but, and I am only a little bit interested in Roman history. Uh, I'm sorry, Mary, I don't wanna read all of your papers and all of your books. I've read one of the books, it was very good, but I don't wanna read the whole lot. But the other thing Mary does is she presents these hour long documentaries on the BBC. And in most of those documentaries, she's cycling around Rome, wearing this bright yellow coat, pointing at things and saying, well, that's where so-and-so died. And that's what a so -and -so, such and such a thing happened. And isn't it great? That's context layer stuff. Mary and all the other TV scientists who you will be familiar with, I'm sure you'll have your own favorites. They take decades of professional experience and expertise, and they make sure that you don't have to read it all. They give you an easy way to understand the basics. That's what TV scientists are good at. And that's what I mean by layers. Okay, number two in my list of tips is to experiment with ideas in bad first drafts and share them around your team for feedback. What do I mean here? I have another hypothesis. I'm gonna jump over the other side again. Uh, my hypothesis is that all first drafts are bad drafts which is what makes them so good. And I say this as someone who has been a professional writer for decades. All my bad, all my first drafts are pretty rubbish. And uh, these days I put more effort into making them worse. Um, why is this a good thing? Well, uh, the ring of power can tell us about this. Um, if you've never read any Tolkien books, like The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, and you've never seen any of the movies, then I apologize in advance for the next two slides, but hopefully enough of you will be familiar enough with the concept for me to carry on, and it'll make sense. Uh, that if you've never seen The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, and uh, you've never read the books, the main thing you need to know is that there are small people called hobbits, and they need to take this magical ring and throw it into an active volcano. Okay, that's it. Um, so, the Ring of Power uh, is a, obviously a central part of the Lord of the Rings, that's why the clue is in the name, but the thing about Tolkien was that he wrote these books in longhand uh, with pen and paper, and he kept all of his old drafts, and years and years and years after his death, his family edited and published some of that stuff, so we have some insight into the development process of that book and of the other books that Tolkien wrote. And that's why we know that these heroes, here you can see the hobbits, Frodo, Sam, Pippin and Merry, and some of their um, our brave noble helpers, Aragorn and Gandalf, uh, when they started out as characters, they had different names. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I am very pleased that the ring bearer was called Frodo and not Bingo. I think that's a good thing. Uh, in the beginning of the story of the Lord of the Rings, there wasn't even a magical ring. And if you go back to it and read it again, you can see this. Uh, Tolkien started writing this second book, which was a follow-up to The Hobbit, and he sent his hobbits off on an adventure, but he got a few chapters in and he realized, there's, I, I don't know what's happening here. Why are these hobbits doing this? What's the point? What's the purpose? He hadn't figured that out. And that was the moment where he went back to his earlier book, back to The Hobbit, and he thought, hmm, this magic ring, what if it was like evil and stuff? What would happen then? And that's how The Lord of the Rings, the purpose of the story appeared. I have been greatly inspired by this in my life. This is what I am like in Google Docs all the time. I am constantly making stuff up writing fiction in formal corporate documents when I don't know the facts, uh, leaving great big gaps in things, um, adding comments to documents like this, where I say, I have no idea what I'm doing. This is what a bad first draft looks like. And this is why it's useful, because it gives you something to show people. And you can say up front, this is bad, but you can help me make it better. My point here is that if bad drafts were okay for Tolkien, given the amount of books he sold, I think they're okay for the rest of us. I love this quote. This is from an American author called Shannon Hale. She said, when I'm writing a first draft, I'm just putting sand into a bucket so I can build the sandcastle later. Isn't that brilliant? 
Remember this when you are writing anything about your work. When you are starting the process, it might be a bit of context layer, it might be a bit of lure layer, maybe it's a chunk of detail, it doesn't matter. But that first draft you write, it can be bad. It's good if it's bad. Why? Because if everyone on a team accepts that the first draft should be bad, then it takes the pressure off everybody. Most people who aren't professional writers don't enjoy the task of writing. So if you establish from the outset that the expectations are low, then that is a good thing. It removes a burden from everybody's shoulders. It helps everyone feel more relaxed. And it also gives you another superpower. It means that your drafts become playgrounds. You can mess around with a draft because it's a draft. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter how crazy and wild your inspired ideas are. It's just a draft. And at the end of the day, you can still just throw it in the bin. Actually, don't do that. Keep it because it might be useful for something else another day. Okay, number three. I'm zipping through these because I want to make sure that I allow time for some questions at the end. Uh, number three is collecting things to show. I said earlier on that at the government digital service, one of the things my team was responsible for was creating snappy catchphrases. This was one of the catchphrases that we used a lot. Show the thing. What was this all about? Well, showing the thing was um, advice to all the teams to actually show what they were talking about every time they were talking. So when there was, say, a product team working on a particular uh, digital service, those teams were encouraged to explain the service with the service. So rather than writing a formal report, instead, do a demo live in a browser with the minister sitting there watching you. If possible, get the minister going through the demo, get them to click the mouse themselves. That was truly brilliant advice for digital teams that wanted support from government ministers who, let's face it, aren't normally people who know a lot about tech or, or the web or anything like that, or user-centered design. What they want to know is, is this going to work? So showing the thing was a mechanism for governance as much as it was a mechanism for communication. But of course, those two things basically became the same thing. Show the thing was really important. And consequently, if, you, if you're going to be showing the things, then it, it puts the onus on you as a team or as an individual to collect things to show. And this is, this is like top tip number 7,000 is you, you get into a habit of gathering things. This is a folder on my Mac uh, where I have shoveled a pile of mostly photos, uh, quite a lot of screenshots, a few PDFs, uh, some links, some quotes, um, what else? All sorts of digital ephemera. I collect this stuff all the time on every project I'm involved with. I always have a folder like this. I always tell the teams that I'm working with to have a folder like this. And I encourage everybody to collect things. It doesn't matter if you don't use them all, that's not a problem. But your fut the future version of you will be very grateful to the past version of you if you do collect them. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, one of the teams in the UK government scene who are really good at collecting things is this lot. They're the digital land team. Uh, they work in something pretty niche. It's all about um, data, uh, about land and housing. So, you know, this isn't going to be something that's going to be attracting a lot of page views because there aren't going to be a lot of people interested in this. But there are some people and communicating to them clearly is just as valid. It doesn't matter if there aren't that many of them. But the team here, if you go to this website, and you click on the week notes or on the blog and you browse through some of the entries that they've got there, you will see not only lots of words, but lots and lots of pictures. You will see all of this stuff. These are just some of the pictures that that team have collected over time and they have used these liberally in all of their communication. And I think it's brilliant to do that. And it's not just pictures. Uh, you can see over there they've got a video clip or an embedded tweet. All of this stuff 
is stuff that they have collected. And then when the time comes to write a blog post or a week note or something like that, they've already got this archive, this library of stuff to make use of, to reference in their communication. So it's really good as a team to get into the habit of doing that collecting in the first place. If you, if you try and do the, the collecting at the moment when you have to write the thing, then, well, you're making your life harder because then you're under pressure already just to do the writing, let alone find all the screenshots. It's much better to try and collect them and gather them and archive them. And if you can curate them a little bit as you go along. So number four, number four is my favorite topic and that's about presenting. And this is where things start to get a little tiny bit uh, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, slidey widey, um, and meta. That's meta with a small m, not a big M. Um, I have a theory about slides, uh, which is that th there are two predominant ways of using slides. Um, way number one, is what I'm doing right now, what I am doing to you. I am presenting a bunch of slides to you. Effectively, I'm performing. I am addressing an audience. And this might be happening, you know, if, when there aren't pandemics going on, this might be happening in person, in, an, in a room with an auditorium maybe, and a, you know, one of those um, things that you stand in front of and a big screen behind me. Or it might be happening like we're doing it now, virtually over the internet that's fine but it's still the same technique it's still the same basic idea i've got a bunch of slides to talk through and i am standing in front of them and talking to you about them this is method one and it's what i would call a type one presentation in other words the slides themselves are designed to be presented they are designed to be illustrative of what i'm saying with my mouth but not everybody in all of the organizations that I have worked with always uses slides like that. Quite a lot of people in quite a lot of organizations, and I, I have tried to stop them, but they just won't stop. Quite a lot of people use slides for things like this. This is a slightly fictionalized version of a real thing that I have encountered. Quite a lot of people actually find it useful to use PowerPoint as a mechanism uh, for writing down structured thought. And okay, I get it, fine. If you wanna use PowerPoint for this, I know that it's useful to a lot of people. A lot of teams find this useful. A lot of managers and bosses find this useful to read something written as a series of slides because there's a certain, there is value in writing that logical structure. And it's also helpful as a writer of, of the text when you've, you've got a bunch of topics in per slide and it's easier to rearrange them and change the, the logical structure of the narrative you want to tell. So I can see the value of this, even though it's not necessarily a technique that I like to use personally. This, I would argue, is a type two presentation. It's something that's designed mainly to be read. And rather than being delivered like this as a performance, it's usually delivered electronically as an attachment to an email, or it's dragged into, a, into Slack or whatever it is. You know, you get a link, you get a document, you get something, and you usually get a, a contextual message saying, please will you read this? So there's these two different types of slides. And I think one of the biggest communication problems happens when people use one kind of slide for the other kind of purpose. Because in my view, these two different kinds of slides meet different needs. The audience in a, in a session like this, like the one I'm doing now, you don't want to read things. You want to sit and listen to me babble on and watch the stuff happening behind me. Uh, and when you are reading a document, it's a completely different atmosphere. It's a different piece of work because you are usually on your own. You will usually be concentrating on a screen or on a device, reading some text and concentrating on what that text says. It's a completely different thing, different environment, different needs. 
And that's why I always argue that one of the big problems is when um, an individual or a team has one of those slide decks designed for being inspiring and performing, and they use it for this purpose, to send to people to read. Or worse still, the other way around, is when you have a, a slide deck written for people to read and you use it as a performance illustrative tool. That's when you get people saying, I hope you can read all those small words if you're sat at the back of the room. And of course, the answer to that is, no, I can't. They're too small. There's too many of them. And of course, in that circumstance, your audience, if, if you're using a type two presentation and you're presenting it as if it's something to be presented, then you are effectively making two demands on your audience. You are asking your audience to pay attention to what's on the screen at the same time as paying attention to what's coming out of your mouth. That's really hard to do. So I care quite a lot about this, as you can tell. Uh, I think it's really important to consider the user needs of your presentation, to think about what you are trying to achieve when you sit down and write a set of slides. And if you're writing one sort, a, a type two designed to be read, and then you find yourselves in a circumstance where you have to present to an audience, you probably need to create an additional type one set of slides that is much more illustrative rather than reuse the type two ones. Um, there is loads more to say about presentations. I could bang on for hours, but I'll spare you that. Um, I have two recommendations. The first one is a website that I helped to make uh, a couple of years ago called doingpresentations.com. Uh, it won't win any awards for design, but that's because I'm not a designer. Um, uh, but it does contain quite a lot of helpful information about uh, uh, tips and advice, not just from me, but from a bunch of other people about doing presentations. Uh, one of those people who contributed to that is Russell Davis. He was my boss when I worked in government. Uh, last year, he published this fantastic book, um, Everything I Know About Life I Learned from PowerPoint. It's really, really good. It's terrifically funny. It's also very well designed, unlike the website that I threw together. So if you want to read a book about presentations and his advice for doing them well, uh, I recommend you grab a copy of that. Fifth and final one of my tips uh, for doing Agile comms is this one, and it's not even mine. I stole this from someone else. Um, I think to stand out, to make, remember going back to the point about how no one has time to pay attention to you and your thing because they're already too busy. If you want to make people pay attention, if you're luring them in using a lure layer and applying some of the ideas of advertising, you don't need to be lots creative. You only need to be a little bit creative. Um, I spotted this when I was reading this blog post by a chap called Simon Willison. He's a Brit, but he lives in the States and he was hiring some people last year. Uh, so he had a lots of CVs and resumes coming into him that he had to read through uh, before asking some of those people to come to interview. And he wrote this blog post pointing out that the people who sprinkled just a tiny bit of creative spark on top of their uh, CV or resume, just a tiny bit, those were the people who stood out as good candidates. And those were the ones that he invited to come and uh, be interviewed. The same applies to doing your communication about your work, in my view. I have one example of this that I'm going to show you now, although there are lots more. Um, uh, I'm a customer of a bank called Monzo. Uh, for anyone who is unfamiliar with it, Monzo is one of those banks that is an app on your phone. Uh, it doesn't have any physical branches in the real world. And um, last year, Monzo sent an email about terms and conditions, about changes to terms and conditions. And um, uh, I'm willing to bet that most of us gathered here this evening are the kind of people who won't read terms and conditions but we'll tick the box to say that we have. That's normal human behavior, right? We all do that. Monzo sent out this email and it included a handful of absolutely brilliant sentences. These ones here in particular, uh, they were talking about this new policy. 
Uh, we will refund you for loss or damage in some cases, but not others. We know that's vague, sorry. What we are and aren't responsible for is quite fiddly to explain in this email. It's all in the terms and conditions if you're interested. There's so much going on here in so few words. It's absolute genius. Uh, they are demonstrating with these words that they respect my time as a customer. They, they understand and they are showing that they understand that everyone is already too busy. They are creating layers. This is kind of a mix between Lua layer and context layer, although yeah, it doesn't, actually it's more context layer. They don't need to lure me in because I'm already reading the email. But what they've given me here is a tiny bit of context. They've said, uh, there is stuff you need to know that we will refund you in some circumstances if you lose your money, but not in others. And it's fiddly to explain. They've, and the creative spark is there because they've used words like fiddly and vague and sorry, and they've hardly used any words at all. They've con they conveyed all this information in just, what, three sentences? It's brilliant stuff. And they have created an easy link to the detail. The detail in this case, obviously, being those actual terms and conditions. And there's a link there. So if I really am the kind of person who really wants to read all those terms and conditions and find out the detail, I can. And it's only a click away. But I haven't. I probably never will. I'm not that bothered. I trust them. I can see from this email that they trust me and they respect my time. So fine, it works. I filed the email away and I probably won't read the terms and conditions. OK, that, in my view, is a good example of a tiny bit of creativity and a tiny bit of layers and a tiny bit of other stuff all combined into one thing. Um, I'm going to stop rambling now. Here's my book. If you'd like to buy a copy, you can get it from agilecomshandbook.com. Uh, if you search for it on Amazon, you'll find it, but I suggest you don't buy it from there. There is a story there that I can tell you when we're next in the pub. Uh, but uh, it's much better to buy it from uh, agilecomshandbook.com. It's £15 plus shipping. Uh, that's it. I will shut up and you can talk to me about things. Thank you very much for listening to me babble. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Oh, another thing, Giles, actually, about the Amazon thing. Obviously, when I first saw about the book and all that sort of stuff, I rushed because uh, it's easy and I have no time and I rush to Amazon. So the cautionary tale is they still keep getting back to me going, we can't get hold of any, we can't get hold of any. And then in the meantime, I bought one from your website. So that is the best place to go. Super. So the usual applies now. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can, if you're too shy or you'd like me to voice them, you can post them in the chat um or you can just you know go get to your guns first shout them out um whenever you you'd want to i do have one to get uh get us rolling um and so and it and it, it does align to a lot of the stuff that you, you've been talking about there so because i had it before i had it sort of prepared from conversations i've had over the past couple of weeks actually um uh, where i've been where i've been working um one of the things I've, I've expressed in where I've been working is that I want to, as you say in your book, um, show the humbug factory. Uh, the, I, I used to see it as a stick of rock factory in the, when they used to show it on the telly from Blackpool, but show how things work and express them and express them creatively. Um, the initial response was, was the usual, um, that sounds good and that sounds exciting. And yes, we know we should be doing that, um, but the breaks, uh, that immediately came on were about branding, were about we have to look. Uh, I think it was more like appear or sound professional. Um, being authentic can be a bit risky, um, and so it, I was I was wondering on your on you know your take on on where 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 they collide or merge or where the rubber hits that road um, is a good place to be. Yeah, how much do you give over to it? Yeah, that that they definitely do collide. That's for sure. And I I should I should caveat what I'm going to say next with with the the statement I'm not a marketeer. Um, <laughs> sometimes I annoy marketeers, and I feel bad about that. But um, 
a lot of organizations, whether they're private sector or public sector, are, are keen to, to be authentic. That, that, in my experience, is generally true. They want to be authentic. And a lot of leaders, particularly in the world that I've been working in in the last few years of leaders of digital teams making digital products, they're quite keen to what the, to, to do what they describe as working in the open. That, that is often a, a, um, a goal that they express quite clearly. And yet they come up, come up against this exact barrier that you've described where they're trying to work in the open, but usually, and particularly this, uh, the bigger the organization, the more this applies, they bump up against some marketing team people, some other comms people elsewhere in the organization who say, well, yeah, it's all very well with you working in the open, but we can't, we as an organization can't say that we've been doing this thing or that thing. At which point my argument is, is usually to go as high up the, up the chain as I can go and say, well, how authentic do you wanna be? Because the, the working in the open bit requires the authenticity and it requires a willingness, a, a corporate willingness to be open about as, as much about what you've got wrong as what you've got right. And this is where the marketing people really, really hate me because it working in the open, as far as I, I'm concerned, means being honest and describing what you have learned, whether it was a learning from something that succeeded or a learning from something that was a disastrous failure. In my view, both of them are equally valid. And uh, in, in the government teams that I worked with, now I know it, government's different. It's, it doesn't have the same commercial pre pressures. I get that. But in the government teams that I worked with, when those teams publicly described what they had learned from mistakes, um, interest in their work shot up, yeah. like enormously. They, they got so much more interest, so many more page views, and so much more feedback when they described something that had gone wrong and how they responded to it. So I, I encourage organizations, even in the private sector, to do that. But I know very often they are unwilling to do so because they don't want to appear unprofessional. My response to that is, I think it's more professional to admit to your mistakes than to pretend they don't exist. And, and I suppose infallibility is inherently untrustworthy. Isn't it? <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. one believes that. That's a good line. I might steal that one. Thank you. Yeah. And we've got a, a question from Tom. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks, Giles. <clears throat> and thanks for um, all the work you've done over the last few years in promoting the GDS's work as a someone that's worked in the public sector for the last 16 years. I think the uh, epochs were before GDS started publishing <laughs> in the open and after. And everything that we were trying to do um, at the council where I worked got a lot easier when it was obvious that good practice was there for us to copy and learn from uh, and uh, you know share and show look it's happening centrally we can do this locally as well so thank you very much for all of that um it, internally we came up against a lot of barriers um it was described as uh washing your dirty laundry in public where i, I worked in an it department and we were showing stuff and trying to build really close collaborative relationships with the department uh and those depart that, that relationship was not used to that kind of collaboration they were very much uh you know we'll tell you what to build and you build it or you tell us what you want us to build and we'll build it and so this transition was quite hard and i just wondered how how you negotiate that that kind of cultural shift from you know we we feel safe in negotiating a contract rather than enter into deep collaborative transparency and and you know how how, how does that how do you negotiate those tricky waters? Uh, uh, with care. Um, I'm, I'm working for a client at the moment that, that feels vaguely relevant. So it's, it's private sector, it's not public sector. Um, but they are undergoing similar change to what you're describing. And I have found, uh, not, I, not just in private sector clients, but from my experience in government, that one of the things that, that makes that change easier, that, that makes 
the collaboration easier, makes the, uh, the, the moments of friction uh, less of a problem is when you have leaders who are, who are equipped to, to grant permission for people to do various things. And not only are they equipped to grant that permission, but they do so with clarity. Um, and one of the things that made GDS successful was that there was a sort of cascade of permission that came down from the minister, from Francis Maud, who was a cabinet office, cabinet office minister at the time, from him down to the, our boss at GDS, Mike Bracken, down to Russell Davis, down to the, the team that I was working in. Uh, the cascade of permission was really, really important and made a huge difference because it was permission to do all sorts of things, not just work in the open, not just make mistakes, but to do work in certain ways. So this client I'm working with at the moment, I have been proactively encouraging the senior leadership there to do certain things, to, to, to write things that, that grant various permissions in various ways. Um, and one of the ways I encourage them to do that is by writing a terrible, terrible first draft and putting it under their noses and saying, what would happen if you published something like this to all of your teams? How, how bad could it be? And, and their response is usually, yeah, it could be a little bit, yeah. can we change a few things? Fine, okay, let's change a few things. We can edit it, we can make it better. And we get to a point where the, the permission's still being granted, but it, it's not as hair raising as my terrible first draft. Does that help? Is that vaguely answering your point? Yes, I think it's, it's also reassuring to hear that this is a, a fairly universal problem. Yeah. Everywhere I've worked, I've seen it. Yeah. I have something similar, unless anyone else wants to put their hands up, but um, I'm just checking the chat as well. Um, so some, something similar along those lines. So um, I actually, I do quite like marketeers. <laughs> I'm so I, I like them. them. Well, I know you, but um, um, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm a bit of a tin pot behavioral scientist and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I love a bit of Rory Sutherland. Um, and the way sort of he might describe communication or marketing really, and communication is a form of marketing, is that, it, it, that it's an experiment. And I often talk about when we communicate, every time we communicate, that's an experiment. We're pretty certain about what we're broadcasting or channeling outwards. We have no idea about how that's going to be received or then responded to. Um, and so when we were talking earlier about, well, the draft, the draft thing uh, uh, um, resonates for me is at what point, and, and in your experience, how have you um, encouraged people to move from, you know, do, do a bunch of drafts, but at what point, you're never going to make it perfect. Now's the time to publish on the understanding that this is now an experiment and we'll see what happens. Um, do you have any sort of techniques for that or any... Uh, war stories as well. Uh, yeah, th there's one thing that comes to mind, which is, uh, I, I completely agree with you that, that every act of communication is an experiment. And um, in, in the book, I bang on for quite a long chapter about blogging, why it's a good idea, even if you don't call it that, um, because calling it that sometimes annoys people for, for various good reasons. Um, and uh, each individual blog post can be considered an experiment and can be considered also, though, part of a longer narrative over time. And that narrative, the, the, the longer time view, that narrative is more useful, I think, than individual posts. Um, but when you publish something as a, an, a, and you're confident about it at the time, one of the beauties of, of, of using the techniques behind blogging, even though, even if you're not calling it blogging, is that it's basically a, a time-stamped thought. Yes. It, is, it is a moment in time where your team is at right now or where your product is at right now. This We thought this at this time. Two years later, you might think something very different. And the, the real benefit lies in explaining in this blog post two years later, or this, whatever it is, presentation, video, doesn't matter what it is, explaining that change, what you have learned in those two years, explaining to the reader 
Um, our digital service now looks completely different to the way it did two years ago. Here's why. Um, it's usually because the team or teams have done research. <laughs> they, have, they have been talking to users uh, uh, frequently and regularly, and they have learned a whole bunch of things about what those users need, and they have responded to those needs and uh, redesigned or rebuilt the service, however it works, um, or redesigned, rebuilt the product, the, the, the mechanism, the thing, the so on. So the, talking about, this is why I think that writing about mistakes is so helpful, because mistakes help you learn. And, and uh, teams love reading about what other teams have learned. Teams absolutely love that stuff for, for, I think it's two reasons. The first reason is um, if, if your team has made a mistake and I read about it, it helps me avoid it. But also if your team has done something that worked, that was successful, and I read about it, maybe I can copy you. Maybe I can, I can save myself some time by doing what you did or a piece of what you did. It might only be a tiny piece. But then I can like respond and say, yeah, 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 we can make use of that. Let's borrow that. And that's why teams love reading about that stuff. I can see some more hands up, so I'll stop talking. Um, I don't, I didn't see whose hand went up first. So. It was Richard. Richard, Richard before me. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks, Dean. Um, thanks so much for the talk, Giles. And just to echo what Tom was saying earlier, just uh, previously, I've uh, gained so much value from your work I can't possibly begin to tell you from way back a decade ago in GDS so thank you for sharing all that you had I've learned masses from you um my question is a bit more about the first of the things you were saying today about the layers and I like the example about Mary Beard and I got that what I didn't quite get and this is the maybe the gap between what you were saying and what I heard uh, was just the distinction between the top two layers yep. so I get that you often encounter teams that give you lots of detail and it's nice then to provide the middle layer which is sort of the one hour version if it's the mary beard talk yeah what's what's the lure what's the top layer i didn't quite get that distinction yeah, that, so that's could you say a bit I, more about that please yeah that's because i failed to explain it um, so yes i'll do that the lure is a is i often describe it as the beckoning finger right it's the thing that says to those people who are already too busy uh carve out a tiny fraction of your busy day to pay attention to this thing or to this team, this product, this news, whatever it is. So the lure literally is there to make people pay attention to you who weren't already paying attention to you. So the reason you don't always need one is let's say, for example, uh, you've got a team, you're designing some sort of web-based product and uh, you're, the audience who you have to satisfy are a bunch of stakeholders who are already engaged with you, right? That you don't have to lure them in. They already have a reason to pay attention to you. So that's fine. In that, in that circumstance, you probably don't need a lure. Um, but there might be other occasions where the people you want to engage with don't already know about you. But it would be really good if they did. And to go back to government examples, one of the things that GDS was trying to do in those uh, a decade ago and still today was change behaviors across government, change what civil servants were doing and the way that they were doing things. So GDS, a lot of the videos that GDS was creating were, were essentially uh, top level lure style engagement. They were stuff to make people, make uh, people in other government departments pay attention to the working methods at GDS and start thinking, well, if, if they can do this thing in an agile way, then maybe our, my team could do that thing in an agile way as well. Um, that's the reason why we made, we had a rule in house that none of our videos would be more than two minutes long, except for the ones that were, but we'll skip that. Um, so uh, uh, that was the whole point of, of making them lure-like to, to borrow these ideas from the world of, of creative uh, uh, communication from advertising and make things that make people pay attention to you. The show the thing poster, that's lure layer. 
What does it do? It makes you pay attention to what's to, to what's going on in the room that you're in, if it's up on the wall, or it makes you pay attention to the slide deck. If you see that early on in a slide deck, because it's bright and it's red and it has huge words on it. That was the kind of thing that I mean. So you only need a lure when you want to attract the people, attract the attention of people who aren't already paying attention to you. Awesome, thanks. Super, and I think to give me time to show the mentee, and just remind me on the chat about the mentee, oh, yeah. um, I think Dean, yours will be the last question if that's okay. Thank you, Matt, I'll be brief. Um, I really like your thinking here, Giles. Thank you so much for, for sharing the knowledge and wisdom. Um, um, one thing I have in my mind is around, um, around communication. That around, I really like the ideas of working in the open, showing your drafts, in, being incremental, iterative, showing vulnerability, learning, all that kind of really good stuff. I see that being really successful internally within internal communications amongst staff and different divisions and business units, for example. I wonder, and I'm intrigued, could this work in, in the open, shown drafts, shown vulnerability, admitting mistakes be done externally, maybe, uh, maybe a government organization or maybe a corporate organization or, or non-profit organization? Be because to show that vulnerability is extremely brave, particularly yep. when there's competition involved. Could there could be, there be avenues for that? Yes, and, and I've seen it done many times. GDS did it. Um, they, they famously had a blog post um, about some icons that were designed for the, the, the beta version of gov.uk. And the icons were supposed to tell the user, you know, this page is guidance, uh, this page is policy, this page is something else. Um, and then they did some user research one day, one of the teams was doing some research. Uh, they found out that none of the users understood any of the icons at all. They were a complete waste of time. So uh, they deleted them overnight and published a blog post the next day saying, we used to have these icons, they were very pretty, nobody understood them, we've killed them, right? Um, uh, and uh, just this afternoon, I was researching this. Um, uh, there are loads and loads of blogs now by engineering teams or by software teams. Spotify's got one, Monzo's got one, Microsoft has got loads of them, Google's got them, you, you name it, any big tech organization these days probably has a blog for its engineers or its software developers to write stuff. Uh, um, uh, Financial Times tech team has got one. And if you go delving into these posts, you will find more evidence of that behavior. Now, they don't always couch it quite as flippantly as I'm couching it. They, they rarely say, we messed up, oops. What they will commonly say, though, is, uh, We've learned something here. We have discovered that if we do this differently to the way we were doing it before, then things get better. Delve into those blogs for anything more than 10 minutes and you will find evidence of that kind of behavior, that kind of um, uh, corporate hubris. It's not hubris, it's the opposite of hubris. Um, that, 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 that corporate admission that not everything is always rosy most of the time. And it's good to see that. Why is it good? Because if you are, this is why, one reason why it really, really works is because if you are a developer and you want to go and work there or you want to apply for a job there, and if you see that it's the kind of organization that is willing to, to admit that it doesn't always get everything right, then I reckon you are more likely to want to apply to work there. That's great, thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's been a fantastic talk, Giles, and brilliant conversation afterwards as well. I will just share my screen now. So those of you who are still on and uh, can see uh, the mentee, uh, grab the QR code or go to mentee.com, enter that code, and please give us feedback on, on, on this evening. Um, and then it just uh, leads me to say, thank you so much, Giles. We'll get the video of this up uh, as soon as possible on our YouTube channel and we can share it for everyone else to see. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you for having uh, me.